Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the right time. My name is Bomani Jones. Thanks for listening wherever you get your podcast. Rate us, review us, give us five stars. You only give us four stars. I'm inclined to believe you are a hater. It is that time of week where we have a guest join us. And I mean, it's kind of Howard Bryant week in the news <laughs> with everything that has been going on uh, of Meadowlark Media. Howard Bryant is here to join us. You are Boston. You like you kind of like you know outside a new edition you like the black dude from boston that we know like not just we being people on the call like i feel like in some total like this is is the thing people don't realize y'all out here there's two of us <laughs> oh, sorry, there's, five, there's, sorry, there's five of us right although i was can i just like be a traitor to my to my town and say i was not a huge new edition guy Ooh. i was not huge I liked them when they got a little bit older, but that Jackson 5 sound was just a little too candy for me. Yeah. A little too, little yeah. too falsetto for me. Well, the other thing is, like, I go back and I enjoy that stuff, but let's be real. They wasn't making their records for you to buy them. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> like, like, you. Like, it's okay for me to say, this is not for me, right? Yeah, Y'all you, ain't even selling this to me. Yeah, you were not the demo. <laughs> like, that was, that, that, that was not uh, what it was that they were going for. Now, we got a lot of different things we're going to get to. We're going to get to Naomi Osaka. We're going to get to Kyrie Irving's weekend and the fans in the NBA. But you told us before you jumped out here to record this that you had been on the telephone for an hour, which left me fairly confident that you had not heard what is being reported. And I am mm-hmm. going to a report now from Clevis Murray. I think it is pronounced Clevis. Uh, mm-hmm. Let me make sure that I have uh, Clevis properly identified. He is a journalist. It doesn't say on his Twitter bio where he works, but I'm guessing it's at Yahoo because it's Clevis Murray at Yahoo. Clevis Murray uh, is re- oh, rushed for the athletic. My fault. Rush for the athletic. Clevis Murray is reporting that uh, Danny Ainge is not certain of his future uh, with the Celtics <laughs> and that he may wind up going to the uh, Utah Jazz. Where he belongs. That's what I was about to say. He can, he, 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 he can go holler at Jabari Parker and be like, hey, dog, let's take it back to the crib. The, oh the, the, the crib, God. you know? You know, I mean, this is interesting in so many on so many levels right i mean one danny ainge did embarrass himself and exposed himself i mean you and i've been talking about this for a while now when you think about the the three historically and when i say historically i'm talking about nba probably leading up to about the early mid in the late 90s i would guess and then the game began to shift as it became more international but up to that point The three whitest teams in the NBA had always been the Boston Celtics, Danny Ainge, the Phoenix Suns, Danny Ainge, and the Utah Jazz, potentially now Danny Ainge, although Danny Ainge is like, you know, there you go, right? Yeah, he was a BYU, he's more, this is. Right? And, And so this would like sort of complete the Danny Ainge circle of the white American in the NBA. <laughs> I mean, it would now the circle is complete. And so, I mean, also we know this, right? Devastating losses have devastating consequences. And you can make an argument, you can make a very, very, very good argument that this Boston Celtics team needs new voices. That they've, that this group has sort of run their course from the beginning of the Isaiah Thomas grinder team to be, you know, to getting more talent. And now, you know, you've got the Jalen Brown and you've got the, you know, the Jalen Brown, Jason Tatum team, you know, the Kyrie Irving experiment that the Brad Stevens thing, they're regressing. They're not as good as they were three years ago. And obviously, when I say devastating losses have devastating consequences, what game are we talking about? We're talking about game seven at home against Cleveland. You've got to win that game. Everything changes if they win that game. And they had a lead in the fourth quarter, whatever it was. They did not handle that. And they've not really been the same team since. Now Everything that was, they've tried his work. Has that, worked. Was, that was the 2018 year when Kyrie got hurt and didn't play in the exactly. playoffs. Exactly. Right? Kyrie wasn't even there. But see, that year made everything weird, though, because That's Kyrie right. then came back the next year and they were not as good as they were 
when That's Kyrie right. was there. And that year before, before he got hurt, Kyrie was playing excellent. He was playing phenomenal. And this is the reason why I say to people all the time, I've been watching Boston Celtics basketball for a very, very long time. And that first half of the year when Kyrie was there was some of the most enjoyable, remarkable basketball I've ever seen. The only thing recently that even came close was being able to see Kevin Garnett up close for the first time day in and day out, where it was like, wow, right? And so for it to fall apart the way it fell out was like, Okay, everyone's going to pay for this. There's only you only have there's only two choices here. You're either going to come back and ball out and fix this or everything's going to fall apart and everything fell apart. And the other piece of this, which I think is even more important in the news right now, is this whole race and Boston thing, which Boston can never seem to get rid of. But where I'm going with this is from a business standpoint, the idea which may very well be Danny Ainge's greatest failing, was the idea that Boston could somehow be in play in this super team, we will lure you to come here. And I'm talking about the whole Anthony Davis pursuit. I think that really did sort of shatter a lot of things in terms of making people feel comfortable, right? Did you really believe that that was possible in this for the city of Boston? to to happen and i never did i was like does danny ainge really think he's going to compete with los angeles and all these other places where you're going to create a super team i just never i never thought that was possible and i thought it really undermined the young players that they had there in the chemistry that they were trying to create there because danny was kind of telegraphing we'll get rid of all of you for anthony davis and i'm like anthony davis is not going to commit to boston i mean bro i mean i'm sorry i'm just go one last thing right In the history of the game, in the free agent game, there have only been two black players who have been able to go wherever they wanted to go and chose willfully the city of Boston, right? It's Al Horford and Kemba Walker. That's it. I mean, Garnett and those guys re-upped, but they were already there. They got traded. I'm talking free agent, A-list, free agent chose Boston. It's a big deal. See, my thing with the Anthony Davis move was, and I still contended, he said he don't want to come here. Cool. You're coming anyway, right? I mm-hmm. would have made the play, like, if you think Anthony Davis is that good, because I've always said they had a team full of low spades, right? Like, they can win a cup book, but if you got to lead with the spade, they're not going to win this book, right? They do not They do not have a joker. They do not have an ace. They do not have a deuce. And Jason Tatum, I still look at as kind of like the king of spades if you, if, if you play with the jokers and the deuce, right? It's a high sp- it's a high-ish spade, right? But it ain't a book that you can count. My thing is, Oklahoma City made a move for Paul George, who wanted to go to L.A., and he liked the team that he was on, and they could and- offer him the most money, mm-hmm. and so he stayed. Like, it, mm-hmm. you got to have some measure of faith in your organization, the way Milwaukee got Giannis to stay there, right? Like, the only way Boston's <laughs> going to get those guys is to trade for them. And my That's thought right. was, you got to bring him in, and then figure out how to make it work. But what you couldn't do, you couldn't have the world thinking you were working on it and that the whole roster is at play with all those young dudes who still think they special. Yep. And then they all got to come back. That's that was right. what you could not do. And that's that was right. that's the people stuff, right? Like mm-hmm. that's what he then came back around and did. And so to me, though, if I was a Celtics fan, I'd be furious, I tell you, furious. If this dude put this team together and nobody really sees a clear path for them to get better, and you got Kemba Walker's bad knees under contract for another couple of years, um, and you're going to leave? That's right. You know, if I'm Brad Stevens, your backup is Ainge. New coach comes in, it's probably a wrap on this, right? For him. A new GM comes in. Yeah, yeah. new GM, yeah. Mm-hmm. Probably mm-hmm. going to be a wrap on this. But the Ainge era for me, man, he got – Kevin Garnett and Ray Allen, and they did the whole, I'll go if you go. You go first. Yep. You go first. Yep. Like, same yep. time, same, same time, same time, right? And then they decided <laughs> they could go there, and they made a nice run out of it. And then after that, I give Ainge credit that he kept them above water, but he had all those picks and all that, and he tried to play for the future and the present at the same time, and you yep. cannot do that, no, right? And in the end, what you got was Jason Tatum and Jalen Brown, not bad guys to have. I don't think you win in a championship with either of them as your best player. Interesting. And I think that on, to, on top of that, when you look at what they were trying to do, 
Um, I, I think you're hundred percent right. I just don't think you can sell this franchise the way you can sell Los Angeles. And that's not even a remarkable thing to say. It's just, and everybody gets their back up. Oh, what are you talking about? Because every city has its challenges, right? Every place has, you've got your obstacles that you have to deal with by being where you are, right? And so that's just how it works. And, and I think that the disruption during that year was enormous to them. I mean, those guys were fragile. And they needed to be told that they were going to be Celtics. And, you know, and you're right. Kevin Garnett is a good example. Kevin Garnett came to Boston and then he became a Celtic. He's out there caping for the logo now. Right. <laughs> I mean, so that's the that's the advantage of saying, OK, he may not want to stay long term, but we're going to get him in here and maybe the culture will shift it and change it. Right. And change right. his mind and he'll stay here. Yeah, Give him something he wants to be a part of, you know, yeah. like that. Like, but you got to like I say, Sam Presti pulls that off. You know what yeah. I mean? Sam Presti got that. And now, granted, they then went and tore the whole thing down, right? But people have to remember, Paul George didn't ask out of there until Paul yeah. George found out they were trying they to were tearing it down. Mm -hmm. Right? And he was like, oh, oh, in that case, I've got an idea that I might be able to propose <laughs> to you guys. I've been talking to my buddy Kawhi. You can send me down there. You, you know, that could be the move you make. Now, the, you talk about, you know, just like the challenges. It's interesting because, look, man, I said this all the time. NBA. If free agency is going to matter in the way it does and players are going to have the power to kind of get to destinations they want in the way they do, bottom line is this league got a bunch of bad real estate, right? It's got a lot of it's places bad. where all things held equal dudes don't robot. want to stay there, right? Like, like, that, that, like, so think about this. And this is, what, this is what they did when they put the cap on contracts, the max contract cap, that they did not realize they were going to be doing. Sacramento got Chris Webber to stay, right? In this day and age, I don't think that happens. Mm -hmm. But they could money whip them. They That's money right. whipped them, and they were like, it's a 45-minute flight to L.A. You can go down there every off day if you want to, and Chris Webber stayed in Sacramento. If you put mm -hmm. Chris Webber back in Sacramento, there's no way they're going to get him to stay if it's about where you want to be, if it's about the real estate. They're not going to be able to pull this off. The difference with Boston, though, and this is, I don't know if it's just with the franchise, but definitely with the fans, Utah, for example. They know nobody want, they know don't nobody want to go play for them, right? Like yeah. even the guy who does, I can't remember if he was the TV guy or the radio guy, but he did an interview right after Gordon Hayward went to Boston, speaking of people, you know, who were trying to like do all the pilgrimages, right? Mm -hmm. he, he was just like, why was it such a big deal for Utah that they lost Gordon Hayward? And it was like, if we can't keep a white American player, who can we keep? Who can we like, keep? He flat mm -hmm. out said it, which by the way, not mad at them right now. Implicitly, no. they might want to ask themselves some questions about why it is that your <laughs> place is not attractive to these people. But he flat out said it. But the people in Utah are not in denial about this fact. Well, they're not going what, wild about it the way Boston does. Yeah, mm -hmm. for whatever and reason. And that's the difference. Yeah, what is it about Boston that makes it where people er, – look, right or wrong, this is where everybody telling y'all. You yeah. can fight it or you might want to deal with the reality that, hey, man, black folks don't rock with what y'all are doing up here. Yep. And in some levels, it's not even really your fault. This is what happens when like, here's the thing about Boston that people just don't want to talk about. Right. And the reason why Boston Boston has all kinds of challenges. Boston, obviously, you've got to deal with the history and you've got to deal with all of that. You've got to deal with the with the perceptions and all that other stuff. But here's what you really have to deal with. If you're a 22 year old black kid living in Boston, is there enough party, enough culture, enough women enough all of the social stuff that a 22 year old wants to do compared to miami <laughs> compared to los angeles i mean i moved <laughs> right? right people move right well, ho but hold, up, to though. hold up though we're not even really talking about 22 though like 22 yeah. is kind of what it is we're talking about like 27 28 who've been around now and seen some places yeah. and are like Nah, I don't think this is the thing that I want to do. Like, what? it's wild because Boston has all, like the Celtics have all this tradition, you know, and when they're good, the fans are all into it and everything. You got an arena that even the new garden has an atmosphere to it and all of this stuff. But, no, 
Yeah, but nobody talks about going and playing in Boston like they do playing Madison Square Garden against the sorry Knicks, right? Now, granted, the Knicks have not gotten really anybody to come sign, but nobody talks about the prospect of Boston. Like, like the mecca of basketball being Madison Square Garden is hilarious when you think about it in an NBA no, context. I do not but ever that, want to have this con- Thank you for that, for adding the NBA context. I didn't mean to cut you off. Yeah, but that, but you see the look on Zion Williams' face when he talks about playing in New York. Well, because that's where yeah. well, the lights come on, right? right that's what right. they talk about. Right, but Boston ain't that. You know what I mean? Like, nobody talks about it in that way. It is not a – and to be fair, Philadelphia ain't a great sell – ain't had a great no, sell to get not. people to come in from the outside either. But when you start talking about the particulars in Boston, and, of course, it came up with the Kyrie situation this week, it is a different level of defensiveness about it. And I get it in part because they like – Well, they're tired of it. You know, Bostonians yeah. are tired of this. It's like, okay – you know, but it is not a great policy to say my position is, what about your house? <laughs> what, what about your neighborhood? What about where you come from? What about? Yeah, that's not that's not it either. But I, I just think that from a, a, a business standpoint, you know that here are the things that we can offer you and here are the things that we cannot offer you, which is one of the reasons why I honestly believe that the NBA needs to find some way to get rid of its salary cap because it's some ways you have to overpay certain guys to get them to stay or to go to places, right? I mean, real estate is an amazing way to put it because when you go early 90s, Phoenix was a great destination. Do you know how hard it is to go 11 years to not make and not make the playoffs <laughs> in a league where half the teams make the playoffs? You don't even have to have a winning record necessarily to make the playoffs in the NBA, although in the Western Conference you kind of do. But the Phoenix Suns, I mean, how many how many true free agent destinations do you have in the NBA? Chicago's not even been a great free agent destination post-Jordan, mm-hmm. right? Miami, Los Angeles, Dallas, Houston, but Houston more. I would Dallas. say Houston, not Dallas. Dallas. I has, say I mean, Mark Cuban's been Dallas. betting on this for years, and it hasn't happened. Right? It hasn't happened. I would say Los Angeles. You know, oh, I mean, Golden State hasn't been a huge. Uh, Golden State is still. I mean, obviously Durant was the big score, so you can say yes, absolutely, it was a success. But you got thirty teams, and you have a half dozen places that people will voluntarily go to. That puts you in a really difficult bind yeah but and and i was gonna say the difference with boston is we wouldn't be having this conversation if they didn't have you know 17 championships that's the that's the incongruity here right which is wait a minute you got 17 championships and nobody wants to come here how do you build that for the future it's like green bay you know it's like Mm. one of these it's one of these weird championship places that is not a magnet right well it there also is in the NBA places, if you're operating on the idea, where is it good to be a young black man with a pocket full of money, right? That's right. Places that fit that description that are not free agent dis- destinations or never have been. Like D.C. At- Atlanta, D.C. Um, mm-hmm. Like those are the two that really jump off the page. Where you're like, damn, still don't nobody even want to go there. Then there's this <laughs> interesting one, which is Orlando, which is yeah. not a free agent destination now, but for people who are not old enough to remember this, I forget what year it was exactly. However, they got, I think it was 2001. They got yeah. Grant Hill and Tracy McGrady to sign there in the same year. And they signed Tracy McGrady because they thought they had Grant. They thought they had Tim Duncan. And yes. Tim Duncan at the end changed his mm-hmm. mind and decided mm-hmm. to go back. Like Orlando was attractive enough at that point that they could get what proved to be at the time three of the best players in the three of the 10 best players in the NBA all wanted to go there in one offseason. None was of us Grant would Hill ever top think 10 back in 01? Oh, yeah, because that was no right. The, an, the ankle crapped yeah. out right before he went to Orlando. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And like they they were able to get those people. Now, granted, this is even after the max salary, I believe, has come around. But they were mm-hmm. they would have been able to pull this off. And so if you're going to get guys to come, you're going to have to do it with a first class organization. And so what That's I right. would look at all these other teams as like, if you want to get guys to come here, you got to do what Mark Cuban did when he got to Dallas. Cause a lot, again, for those of you not old enough to remember, they were a flat out laughing stock when he sure bought that were. team. They were by far the worst team in the NBA, worse than the expansion teams. 
Like they were the worst team in the NBA. And then Cuban did the stuff like make the locker room plush, right? The yeah. most comfortable sense seats on the bench for the players and all of that stuff. That's what you had to do. And so all yeah. these teams, it's like Danny Ainge, instead of fighting it, no, nah, man, y'all need to be out here and like having an MLK Day thing bigger and better than anywhere else in the league, right? Or whatever it takes to make people feel like, no, Boston is a place that you want to be. The baseball yeah. team figured it out, but they figured it out because they were like, yo, those Dominicans are black, but not like we talking about. They That's got their right. own part of town over here where they can go speak Spanish and get the well, groceries exactly. that they like and they'll come mm -hmm. and they did well and that was the other thing i was gonna say it was like you know people that don't understand boston what they don't understand most about boston is that boston is not boston is not a african-american city only it's an island city you got i mean my people were from barbados you got you got haitians there you got dominicans you know, you got Hunter. I mean, you got all kinds of black people in Boston. So if you've got a small black population in the first place, now you had a black international population. Like when we were growing up in Dorchester before we moved, right? I mean, I think we were the only black family, black American family Hold on up. the block. We have to stop. As mm -hmm. we sit here, Danny Brad Quinn. Stevens is moving into the front office on a full-time role, and the Celtics are expected to start a search for a new head coach. Sources tell ESPN. <laughs> this, this is the Boston mode. show. This is it just, Boston It just show. all happens. And the hits keep on coming. All I was going to say was that the brother living next door to us in Boston was Haitian. He was kicking a soccer ball. He didn't have no basketball, right? <laughs> I mean, this is – if you want to understand Boston, you got to understand that it is not your traditional – black you know city in the black population because you, you're dealing you know you're dealing with a lot of island folks up there so right. so the culture of the city has to be sort of dissected and people just get their backs up way too much you can't even have a single conversation with people immediately jumping down your throat going well, what what, are, what about new york what about howard beach what about bensonhurst what about it we talking about boston right now let's deal with what you have to deal with especially if you're trying to attract people to come to play for your team right, right. well all i'm saying is what i don't think boston folks get is for whatever reason man black people go all around this country right two things to keep in mind number one people jumped on them railroad on, on the railroads and went everywhere baby they went to chicago mm -hmm. they went to milwaukee they, they got in their cars and they went to California. They mm -hmm. went to New York. They went to D.C. They went to Philadelphia. They went all them places. They wasn't buying them tickets to go up to Boston, baby. Like, for, yeah. whatever, for whatever reason, the word got down. Like, nah, nah. I don't know. Maybe y'all ain't had no factories, right? Maybe the job situation wasn't cracking. I don't know. But the word got out. Like, we, like the great migration stories are not there for Boston. When it was a, it was a huge metropolis, right, for whatever reason, didn't quite make it there. That's number one to consider. Number two, we as black people go all over the place and people just wind up with visceral reactions about Boston that they do not have about any other place, right? It's not that it's the only racist place in the world, right? But for whatever reason, it this lands people differently in that city. It but lands that's also, differently but, in but that city. I had a buddy who made a point once and I think this is worthwhile. And his thing was, you got to understand that people in Boston are assholes, right? And so his thing was... Massholes. Yes, but they're, they're, they're jerks. So when you add the natural jerk to the racism, it gets exacerbated. But they're also mean to each other all of the yes. time. So it's like all of it winds up getting heightened where is the racist... Are they more racist than other people? I had to get rid of that, Bo. When I first moved to California, I realized... What an asshole I was. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm actually serious about this. Do you know why? Because it's that East Coast sarcasm that we have. Like if you ask somebody a question, right? The East Coast in you may very well have to give you some sort of snappy answer instead of just saying yes or no. Mm -hmm. What time is it? What time does it look like? Just <laughs> give me the, just tell me what time it is. <laughs> right? What's it look like? What do you think? <laughs> Why are we doing this right now? Right? I mean, and so there's a certain delivery that we have on the East Coast, Boston, New York, Philly. And that's why they talk about us as, you know, as fans, Boston, New York, Philly, most hostile places. And it's true. It's, it is a different delivery. It's a different place. I always said that, it, you know, it's, it's, 
the problem with Boston as a as a as a place is Boston is the is the city not that I mean it's it's got the small enough black population and people are fighters. Yes. People be fighting in Boston for their space. And there's not a lot of space. And it's dominated by a group of people historically, the Irish who came to that city, who said, you guys stomped on us. You guys being the, you know, being the, the blue bloods, being the Brahmins. And we've got power now. We're talking the 1800s, late 1800s. And we're never giving it up ever. You know, you go to New York. Okay, New York's had a black married. New York's had a big enough black population where you can sort of share the city a little bit. You know, Chicago, you've had two black mayors. You got, you know, you got two black mayors in Chicago. You know, you got a big enough black population where you can share the, the, the road a little bit. Boston is like, Shamrock, this is ours. This is ours. And you've got to un undo that. And one of the hardest things is, is that once again, in terms of fighting with each other, once that real estate starts to build the way it builds, you know, now people are getting pushed out of their neighborhoods. Like, oh, wait a minute, the white people are getting pushed out of their neighborhoods too. So the whole city begins to shift. But historically, that city is a very, very, very insular place. When we were growing up there, they used to tell us all the time, Boston will give you a chance if you start somewhere else. <laughs> if you start if you start your career somewhere else then boston will claim you they're like oh he's from boston and we'll bring you home but you're not starting your career there you, there's no entry level for black bostonians there and my career started out just like that i started my career in california why because there was no real opportunity i mean when you go there and they're trying to change it the whole thing but that's the reason you walk in there and you don't feel like there's a place for you here right that city belongs to them and you can feel it when you're there and there is no getting around that and also boston's got a fit you know boston for all the sports part you know look boston put two racists out there to, to be the face of their sports media that's what they did for years you got to wear that too bad right and the red that was a flag you know eei was a flagship station for the red sox did the red sox go yeah we don't want to be represented like this nope they took the ratings so take it and wear it it's mm -hmm. on you the one thing i say for boston the, the nba stuff in particular i have a talking point for you guys all you folks in boston i think i've told you this one but if you need to feel like yo when you do the what about them thing this is the one so red our box seemed to understand that hey when we were winning championships we had all these black dudes we wasn't selling tickets so we're going to need to have some white dudes on the bench. Brian Scalabrini never going to have to pay for another meal in Boston for the rest of his life. And he ain't do nothing on the basketball court. He was just the white dude on the Boston Celtics when they won he's their last the championship. He's on now. Mm -hmm. Right, right, right. So he's going to have all that stuff. Okay, got it. But they always had the white dudes. But they still had a team. Like St. Louis. I forget what documentary I was watching. But people know the story about the uh, St. Louis Spirits, the ABA team. Yeah, Spirit of St. Louis. Right. Mm -hmm. And they had um a share of the tv money because when the league mer when the leagues merged they took four teams the spurs the nuggets yeah. the nets and the pacers and they did not take the spirits now the, the thing with the spirits was the owners were sure that they would get brought into the league because at the time st louis was the largest market that did not have an nba team so they were positive they would be absorbed and the nba was like son we tried this before and yep. it's just too racist. We can't right. make it happen. There is your what about if you're Boston. At least we can have a damn basketball team. That's right? true. Some, some ways, I tell people, be careful. Watch out. Them places that got hockey teams and no basketball team anywhere nearby. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Watch what you do at night, baby. You never know right. how that might go. Right. Although, although, and here's what's really interesting, like from the, from the historical spirit of St. Louis. And by the way, might be the greatest business deal in the history of sports. Oh, yes. Yes, we'll, sheer we'll take, dumb luck. Exactly, we'll, exactly. We'll take a half percent of all your revenues in perpetuity. <laughs> That's free, <laughs> free billions. <laughs> anyway, um, um, what was where, where was Bill Russell going to go if he wasn't traded? St. Louis. St. Louis. So Bill Russell had St. Louis or Boston. <laughs> <laughs> Right. He was like, well, that's right, because the Warriors were still on the East Coast, so he could not be a territorial pick for his exactly. for the local market. Couldn't even go home. That's <laughs> St. right. St. Louis. Your choices are St. Louis or Boston.
That's yeah, it. but it, no, it's, it's true. But you know what? I always, like I said, I always look at it this way. And it's like, I'm like, if you want to win, how do you win? It's very, very clear that the Boston Celtics as a city, as a franchise and as a city, you're not going to be major players in the free agent market. You've got to build your team differently. It's like Toronto. When Toronto in baseball, they always knew that because of the exchange rate and everything else, they had to try to build their team differently. Certain players simply were not going to go to Toronto. They didn't want to pay the taxes. They didn't want to deal with the international um, element of being on that team. And everybody loves Toronto. Nobody says Toronto, awful city. Toronto is one of the best cities in North America. But still, that didn't mean that people would sign free agent contracts there, right? So, which is why, you know, Masai made that deal. That's that's the same Anthony Davis thing. I'm not coming there. Yeah, you are. You're coming here anyway, and let's see what we do with it. And mission accomplished. They got their championship, right? So, I just think that the you're right. I think the defensiveness level is so silly because what you have to look at instead is how do we get players? Not, well, what about Chicago? How do we get players? How do we make this work? Yeah, good luck. You got to, as I say, they did a decent job with the drafting. Now they got to keep them. And now who knows who's going to be the coach, the general manager, uh, or That's anything right. and else. Danny, and let's face it, last thing on Danny, then we can talk about Naomi Osaka, whatever else you want to talk about. But last thing about Danny, Danny reminds me of that Saturday Night Live skit back in the day. I don't even know if anybody remembers it. I think it might have been Tom Hanks, where he had the Super Bowl tickets and had a price that he was going to sell them for and no other price. And ended up like holding on and the game was over. And that was Danny with all those draft picks. It's like, dude, you cannot, you're right. You cannot play for the future. Like, you know, hoarding assets, Danny Ainge, asset hoarder, right? And at the end of the day, did you really maximize what you had there? And you could make the argument. You really could make the argument. You got Kyrie Irving, you got Jason Tatum, and you got Jalen Brown. You could say mission accomplished from an acquisition standpoint. You could make that argument. It just didn't work. Commercial support for this podcast is provided by BetterHelp. In May's Mental Health Awareness Month and throughout June, The Right Time with Bomani Jones is proud to join the cause of destigmatizing therapy. If you are struggling with relationships or having difficulty sleeping or difficulty meeting your goals, if you're feeling anxious or stressed, BetterHelp counselors can listen and help. BetterHelp will assess your needs and match you with your own licensed professional. You can start communicating in under 48 hours. It's not a crisis line. It's not self-help. It's professional counseling done securely online. Services available for clients worldwide. Log into your account anytime and send a message to your counselor. You can schedule weekly video, phone, or even live chat sessions. BetterHelp is committed to facilitating great therapeutic matches, so they make it easy and free to change counselors if needed. It's more affordable than traditional offline counseling and financial aid is available. So many people have been using BetterHelp that they're recruiting additional counselors in all 50 states. Our listeners get 10% off their first month of online therapy at BetterHelp.com slash Bomani. That's BetterHelp.com slash Bomani. Yeah. Now, uh, for the next part of uh, Howard Bryant week... um, Naomi Osaka will not be competing in the uh, French Open. I've seen that you have been trying to talk to people about this on Twitter, and I don't know why. Unsuccessfully. Um, yeah, like I don't, I don't really understand why you decided to take on that move. A friend of mine hit me up, and like, here comes Howard talk about what about the journalists? I was like, I actually think it takes a little more nuance than that. But I didn't you know, say what about the journalists, did I? I mean, but they. I think that it's difficult for a lot of people who observe media people talking about this that they view it through the lens of anything other than the media's self-interest. Well, um, people hate us. That's the thing that people don't understand about this. It's like, and this story is such an amazing story because like all amazing stories, it's not a this or that. There are so many other elements to this. The real, you know, when you really want to break this down, Bo, I mean, the real part of the story is between Naomi Osaka and the federations. I mean, it's really, media is sort of third in this. It's them forcing you to do media. And I have always said, when I talk about open locker room and everything else, I walk up to dudes, are you talking today? Nope, okay, cool, I don't take it personally. You don't have to talk, I cover an industry. The people who run the industry, I expect them to talk, I expect the owners and general managers and those guys to talk, but the athletes, I never, I don't get mad if they don't wanna do interviews, it's fine. What I don't like is for them to talk, you know, to not wanna do interviews and then be criticized for not doing interviews and get mad about that. You don't get to have everything, right? I mean. 
you have, you know, you do something very, very public. We do critique that. That's what we do, period. That's what the job is. Um, but yeah, I think, I think you realize, look, we're the enemy. And you want to talk about low-hanging fruit. It's very easy to hate media, and especially because media is not even media, right? There's a difference between, you know, Stephen A and Skip and Max and those guys, they're not in the locker room anymore. You know, that's media, but that's not press. That's not what we, they're totally different. You know, each element of this is different. And so there's just so many different layers to, to, to deal with. And, you know, you always know going in that if you talk about your profession, everybody hates you. And that's fine. We're supposed to have an adversarial relationship at some level with the business because who wants to be asked questions that they don't want to answer? Who wants to? I mean, I wouldn't want someone calling me, asking me to critique every, you know, I, I got a problem with your column. Well, good, right? After a while, it's like, get away from me. I mean, what we do is adversarial by nature in a lot of ways. I get that part. But what I don't understand in this story, because people are stupid, but, you know, one of the parts that bothers me is if you really break down what's taking place, it's between Naomi Osaka and the Grand Slams. It's not us and Naomi Osaka. I mean, we don't necessarily, you know, make those interview rooms easy. I mean, that all that stuff is very difficult. And, the, you know, the reporters ask, that's a different layer to this. But the actual point, the battle point here is between the Grand Slams and the athlete, which makes it a labor story. Yeah, see, my the problem that I have with a lot of the way that it wound up being received is, Osaka herself was very clear on what her problems were with this mm -hmm. at various points. That's right. Very little of this other discussion has had anything to do with what, with she, what she said, said. her That's problem right. was, right? So coming out the gate, she said that her problem was that, you know, in this time, she gets questions that make her doubt herself and that she does not want to doubt herself in this time and i think she used the term mental health in that description and i thought that led to a like a fair broader discussion about i think you're entitled to a certain measure of peace are you entitled to confidence right because part of what sports is is pushing through those moments of struggling with confidence and so forth and so on you know so like when it was on that when i was like i mean i understand why you don't want to do this but i don't know if this necessarily is the is is i don't know if this is the way to go about it then came the statement from the slams and I got where they were coming from. They're like, we are the show, right? The people are coming mm -hmm. here to see us. And it was interesting that it was all the slams that said that because the French could say that individually and have an argument. Naomi Osaka was probably not going to still be in the French open by next week, right? Her yes, track right. record indicates that that probably would not have been it. She was not driving things at the French open. She's a big star, but she wasn't pushing that engine. No, they would be just fine if she did not do this. But all of them got together because it's like they looked around and they saw what was going on with the world. And they were like, oh, no, no, no. We have to protect the turf. We're all going to get together. And now we're going to do this, which is why it's funny that after Osaka was much more thorough in her explanation about where she's coming from and how she feels while doing this press availability and why it is that she does not want to do it. At that point, our opinions about a the larger press conference thing or whatever kind of sort of stopped mattering, right? Like she's Absolutely. talking about something very particular and very, and very specific. Yeah, very specific to her. Mm -hmm. I don't quite know how this turned into everything else, right? Because like, they hate, because everybody hates us, because we're the easy target. Yeah, yeah, but I, right? I don't, but I don't think it's just because they hate us. Well, it's not just because they hate us. I think I, I have a, a, a theory. Right? One of the theories on this too is that we reflect. People bring their grievances to an issue, even if the issue isn't about their grievances. There it is. And the grievance right now is how do we, how are black women being treated? And there's every, every avenue that you have to get us to that point will get you to that point, right? Whatever it is, whatever the subject is, she's not talking about this, but this is an avenue to get to that point. Yes. Right? So that's really what we're talking. People have been laying in wait, waiting with when, if, if you cover tennis, if you watch tennis, especially the way tennis is sold because of these you know, snippets of the press conference, it's like these black women athletes walk into the podium and get savaged by these, you know, almost completely white international media who ask horrible questions, right? This is the way the tennis fan views tennis, right? 
that Serena, and this is what this really does come down to once again, is massive, massive, massive protection and retribution in some ways. And I don't think retribution is the right word, but it's, it's, it is a, um, what's the best word for it? It's a reassessment of how essentially Venus and Serena have been treated. And now you're going to do it to the heir apparent. Right. Right. But it, is it what Osaka said? But it's the not what she said, but it's not what say. she's talking yeah, right, about. Right, right, It's not what she said the problem was, right? And so that became the thing. It was a like this broader thing about press conferences. Yes. And, and I honestly mean no disrespect to the people who are listening here, but like y'all don't do this. I mean, That's I don't right. like I do it. I do it enough to know the purpose of the press conference or whatever it is, right? But people have some very interesting opinions about press conferences without like even doing any thought as to why it is they exist or what the utility is of crowdsourcing a lot of what this they stuff. Are. Yeah. Like they, like they, they, like, you know, so it's just like, I don't understand why they got to sit there and answer the same question over and over again. Well, actually the press conference is to stop you from having to answer the same question over and over again, because without the press conference, there's going to be a line of people to ask you exactly. the same question you over and over the again. Players, that's right. If you ask the players, would you rather have, I mean, Press conferences are a compromise. It's what keeps the locker room closed. Would you rather have open locker room? The answer is like, no, absolutely not. We would rather come out and do press yeah, than right. have that locker room be open. Yeah, but I also think that the way that people consume these press conferences is, so when somebody, if you're putting together a television package about what happened in the match, chances are you're going to take a quote from the press conference, right? That clip that you're going to take and put in and use the sound on tape in your package on the match, that clip is not going to be interesting at all because the television package is not conducive to taking what might be interesting. So like take Bill Belichick, for example, take it to a different sport. We get the on to Cincinnati, on to Cincinnati, on to Cincinnati type stuff. But if you hit Belichick with a good question about football, he will go on and on and on about theory and everything else. And yeah. you will find it on Twitter in a block of text that somebody has taken out of the transcript and then shared mm -hmm. with everybody else. That is not going to wind up being on television. Another problem with the press conference is that if you are writing your own piece, you don't want this good stuff to be offered at the community trough where everybody now all of a sudden is using your fantastic question or everything else. But as much That's as everybody right. says these press conferences are useless, if I tell you there's a press conference on right now, either... ESPN will break into it if it's important, or you will go out of your way to watch it. These things well, are they're not with they're not without a measure of utility. There are going to be people there who ask bad questions, certainly, right? And it's hard to it's also hard to ask good questions at a press conference. Like I don't think people quite understand the difficult the degree of difficulty, even for the journalist. Like I'm on TV too right now. I'm in front of the same room full of people well, asking right. this question in and the way that my, you are with my peers. And, right. And absolutely. And also, I was never good in press conferences, and for two major reasons. One, I didn't want everybody to know what my questions were, and two, because it's theater, you get worse questions and you get worse answers. Be the, the best interviews you can do are when the cameras are off because the, the defensiveness, you know, we live in a time where everybody feels that the goal of interpersonal communications is to dunk on each other, right? So if you're a professional athlete and somebody's asking you a question on camera, a lot of times they're thinking, well, this question is meant to embarrass me. Right. What you're doing is you're trying to create some sort of viral soundbite or viral video that's going to embarrass me when really what you just want is information or maybe you are trying to embarrass them i don't know but i know that these press conferences certainly make you know when we would be in the when we were on the beat when you're doing when we used to go back into manager's office it used to work very simply we go into the manager's office covering baseball tv would come in the cameras would be on everybody would they would ask their questions the writers would generally not ask their questions then the cameras would go off and once the cameras went off, then we actually talked to the manager. And the man, then we could actually, we all spoke. We talked about what was on the record. We talked about what was off the record and we actually had communication. But now when you put everything in podium, in a podium situation, now everything is televised. Everything is advertised in this way. And it, it, it creates the possibility or the perception that I'm trying to hurt you. 
right? I'm trying to embarrass you. I'm trying to get you to say something stupid so the whole world can see it. When really, if you're just sitting at somebody's locker, it's just two people talking, right? I mean, so now that everything has become podium based and you don't have that at locker interpersonal stuff anymore, it all looks like theater. It looks like, it looks like you know, sword play. It looks like we're fencing. And that's really, you know, it just adds to the adversarial nature of the right. of the job. Right. And then we get back to Osaka, who just like when it, to me, when it sounded like I don't like doing this. Yeah, I wasn't sure. When it got to no, 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 like this is a problem. Oh, okay. Well, I'm and that's I was gonna say, Bo, that's a really big deal because one of the other things that she said was she said that this is difficult for her. Right? Right. She said this is difficult for her. She didn't say that it was unfair or unjust or whatever. She didn't say that that doing these things is something that she shouldn't have to do. She said, this is difficult for me. Right? And yet that has been extrapolated out to, well, we're just killing the athletes and we this has to stop and you know, we're destroying them. And it's like that's not what's happening. What she's saying is, is that this piece of this job description. I have trouble with. Now, here's the other piece of this that people don't seem to get, right? Tennis as a sport, one of the, you know, the culture, what do you want your sport to look like is a really big piece of this. And when you cover tennis and when you get it come, come up in the game, everything is about mental toughness and sports in general. What do we always talk about? Overcoming adversity, overcoming adversity, mental toughness, 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 right? And in tennis, you don't have any coaching. You can't talk to anybody on the court. You don't have any teammates. The entire root of the sport, part of being a champion in that sport is you figuring it out, right? That is really a huge part of this sport. It's, you know, there are no timeouts. It's not like, okay, I serve two double faults and I get to just take a little mental health break and call a timeout. You know, there's a 10-0 run, Celtics call timeout, right? You can't do that in tennis. You got to figure it out. And so. Some of this, when you start looking at the the reaction to it, it's like, oh, well, you know, this is this is just part of the job. And what's really happening here is you have a player who is suggesting maybe this culture needs to change. Maybe the way we do things in this industry has to change. And part of that is how, you know, how each individual handles their responsibilities match and post match now to your question great question about about are you entitled to confidence you know if you're the williams sisters or someone you know part of them like you heard what both venus and serena were saying you know i'm thick i'm not thin or this is just how i handle it what they're saying is is that my mental toughness and being a champion carries over into these press conferences everything i do in terms of my victory comes in the face of all of this hostility around me. Very, very different conversations about yeah. how, what the culture of this sport is gonna be. Yeah, and I admit, as someone with my wiring, I don't struggle to empathize with people who struggle with confidence, I just can't relate. Yes. Like there are places where my confidence is shaky, but you just gotta do it. You know, like, like right. and, I, and I recognize that that is a bit of a regressive view in the eyes of a lot of people. I don't blame people for seeing it as such, but like, I never know myself personally what the line is. And so, for example, when she says, I don't want these people, you know, I don't want to hear these questions that make me doubt myself. My empathy meter on that is on the floor. Like yeah. me personally, I could be wrong about it or whatever. I'm just kind of like, okay, well, I guess that means you got to start doing a lot more winning. You know what I mean? Like, like that. Well, you're in a fight. Well, I yeah. think that's the thing is that you are in hostile territory. That's how I view damn near everything. You're in hostile territory. People are fighting you. You don't, you know, it's not, it's not, it, it's the difference between, you know, the internal versus the external, right? I believe that the external is, is hostile territory and that it will always be hostile territory. And, you know, th that I don't expect anybody to be anything but hostile to me when I'm trying to work on something, right? Because everyone's trying to dunk on each other. So I wouldn't expect anything but um some level of doubt to be part of it you listen to nadal nadal talks about doubt all the time it's something that you know he's actually really fantastic on this subject i think i'm there's a possibility that i'm going to lose all the time right i mean this is and this is his sort of internal battle of how he deals with um his preparation 
you can always lose. And so the question to me is also, you know, I think what Osaka was doing in terms of bringing part of this up is, you know, there's a cultural question about how much, how much does the tournament have to bend to help you be a champion, right? Does it, does it have a responsibility to help you be a champion? Or is this also part of what champions overcome? You overcome the fans, you overcome the media, you overcome yourself, you overcome your opponent. And at the end, you hold up the tie, you hold up the trophy. Yeah. This, I mean, it to me is a fascinating story. If we could just stop talking about ourselves, just, just like, like, even, me, like even me right there, like I had to recognize I have to step outside of me and the way that well, I that's, view that's crises right. of confidence and recognize this is a different thing for. Yeah, and I was going to say one last thing about that too, is that in this, the reason why this became a journalism or has become a journalism issue is because people have, people have grievance toward journal, toward media. People have anger toward media. People are upset about how this piece of it works. And also because they don't understand what our jobs are. I think that people, people have a, a lack of professional respect for what we do anyway. We're not part of the story. We're not supposed to be part of the story. And I, you know, I got criticized on this because I, you know, sent out a, you know, my own Twitter thread about, about tactics. I felt like, look, the minute that this thing went public. And this is a generational thing that has to be discussed at some level. That I think that last week, Naomi Osaka's initial statement was one of defiance. At least that's the way that the, that the Grand Slam board saw it. They saw it as defiant. And if you're going to ignore this piece of it, then I just got to laugh. They got their backs up. And once they got their backs up, now it's a fight. And once it's a fight, now we're going to fight. And the Grand Slams decided that, okay, you want to you wanna act like this? Okay, here's what we do. I think all of this didn't have to happen. I think that, I think that you know, Osaka played two clay tournaments before the French started. She played Madrid and she played Rome. If she had gone behind closed doors and said, hey, can, is there some way we can work with this? I'm struggling or I'm not dealing with this well. I think the conversation is different. You know, maybe they would still say shut up and play. And even if they did say shut up and play, she could have said, look, I told y'all this was hard for me. I told you I was struggling. I told you there was difficulty here. I gave you advance warning that something that I'm trying to navigate my way to be a champion here. And y'all didn't listen. Even that makes the conversation different. Right. And but that part didn't happen. And so now you're in a battle. And, you know, once it becomes a staring contest, then all bets are off. All right. That is Howard Bryan. Check him out at Metal Lark Media, my man. Greatly appreciated. And ladies and gentlemen, thanks so much for joining us here on The Right Time. We do this thing three times a week. My man Gabe Bassane handles everything behind the scenes. Thank you, sir. Remember, follow The Right Time. Rate us, review us, give us five stars. You only give us four stars. I'm inclined to believe you are a hater. We'll talk to you guys in a couple of days. Take it easy. <laughs>